thank you. And uh, I'll be talking about integrating things into pervasive computing environments. Uh, I must warn you that many of you were uh, at Joseph's talk yesterday. I don't have many pretty pictures like he had. <laughs> it is mostly text. Um, so this is the overall organization of the talk. Uh, I will talk about pervasive computing and uh, things and Internet of Things. Uh, the two terms, Internet of Things and cyber physical systems, are used interchangeably in many places. And how do we integrate per things into pervasive computing environments to empower pervasive computing environments? And what are the challenges? In particular, I'm going to talk about service composition using uh, things and some research issues and challenges and applications of pervasive computing. So most talks on pervasive computing start with Mark Weiser, uh, who is uh, uh, said to be the father of pervasive computing. And as he wrote an article in 1991, uh, in, in Scientific American. And basically, he said, creating smart environments with ubiquitous, invisible, interconnected devices that provide unobtrusive services to the users. So basically, pervasive computing means how I can make you utilize all the resources in the environment. But as far as the user is concerned, they are not visible to the user. The user is able to see only the services and the benefits he gets from, from computing and communication devices. So the objective is, of course, to improve users' experience and quality of life without, underlying, without requiring them to know the underlying technologies. That is, for example, he wanted a nurse or a school teacher or a lawyer to know to utilize pervasive computing without having to learn some of the uh, uh, technological terms or uh, things that are needed. So even though he made this observation in uh, about 27 years ago, we are still struggling to achieve this objective. Okay, despite all the advances we have, we have made in, in, in uh, computing and communications and other areas. So I will digress a little bit. Um, if you see this, you can assume this is for uh, bandwidth. This is for memory density. That is how much of memory you can pack into one square centimeter or one square millimeter of a chip. And the green one is for processor speeds. So with time, you can see this is increasing with from 1970s here to current and future. This is always increasing. Okay, This is something that we are all aware of. Now, what is this blue line here, constant line? What does that indicate? Any guesses? It is constant. It has not changed since the 70s or since we started living. Okay, human capabilities or human capabilities might have increased, but what I would like to really say is that we have only 24 hours, seven, seven days a week. The time we have to do things has not increased. Okay, so basically we are using computing, communications, and all these technological advances to help ourselves to incre increase the quality of life so that we can do uh, more efficient things, things efficiently, even though we have only so much time. Um, this is, you may or may not agree with me, that's okay. Uh, if you again look at the years as well as what are the focus areas in different uh, time windows over the last uh, 35, 40 years, uh, this is just to capture what is, what is current in those uh, areas. Of course, there are uh, topics like theory, architecture, software systems, programming languages that have been developing all the time. Whereas these, some of these areas are hot or, or, or um, hot areas for research okay, during those time periods. Uh, 
like for example, I started working in parallel computing, but for a long time there was not much happening in parallel computing. Okay, so but again it is coming back because we have multi-core architectures on, on devices, we have already we are exhausting the computing power that is already available for, for example, for deep learning uh, algorithms and, and, and handling big data and so on. So therefore, there, are, there is again interest in, in parallel computing today. And I'm sure there will be interest in the near future in networking and communications uh, because we, there would be no big data, there will be no privacy issues, there will be no machine learning had it not been for the advances in systems and networking. Okay, if we did not have powerful processors, if we did not have sensors, if we did not have uh, bandwidth running into gigabits per second, there would be no big data. So if you still had a few megabits uh, per second bandwidth, that is, you cannot imagine that we would have so much of data in the, in the environment today. So it's possible because of advances made in, in, in architecture, in systems, in networking, and so on. So very soon, as we know that with deep learning, the number of layers in the neural network is increasing with time, with the, with the amount of data that we have. And we are going to soon exhaust the computing power that we can perform. And we want to do things faster, everything we want to do faster. So therefore, uh, there will be need for looking at uh, improving computation speeds, improving negative, uh, uh, networking speeds, and so on in, in, in the near future. And a related thing to that, that is very relevant to this talk, uh, this is actually what I wanted to bring in is here. Uh, during the early days, it was very small computers and it was everything about the computer. And later on, it was for some specific applications. This is when we were studying to, um, uh, we were studying computer science and learning uh, different uh, areas in computer science. They were mainly for some specific applications, whether uh, finance industry, uh, space industry, military, and so on. So parallel, uh, the, most of the computing applications were in those areas, and that's why you will see that areas like uh, parallel computing, networking and communications, and distributed computing were really the hot areas during those days. And slowly things changed because of the development of the chip technology, that's VLSI technology, that you can have a very small chip that can go into a mobile phone, and you, you have powerful radios on mobile phones. So therefore, communication, really the networking communication and the VLSI architectures paved the way for a large-scale computing, and which, in, during this age, it was mainly about human-centered. So all this while, we were thinking about applications and computers, but in recent years, we are more focused on ourselves. We want better entertainment. We want everything on our phone, okay? So we want to improve our quality of life and so on. So this has been, the, the human has been the centerpiece in computing development over the last several years. But I believe, I may not be right, but I believe in the future, things will move on to global scale. And we want to improve society, we want to improve uh, the environment, we want to uh, conserve resources like water, electricity, uh, uh, oil, whatever natural resources we have, we have to stretch their uh, uh, longevity so that we can live longer. We don't want to exhaust the resources we have. And the question will be how we can use computing. How can we can use computing and communications to, to improve this, okay? Say for example, conservation, how to reduce pollution. So there are a lot of uh, research, area, research uh, groups that are working in these areas. And again, in that aspect, because we are directly uh, trying to interconnect with the physical world, interconnect with the environment, interconnect the cyber world with the physical world and the environment, that's where uh, sensors and things come into uh, the picture. So this is just a list of uh, current and future applications of, of uh, computing and in particular pervasive computing. I believe it will be focused on society, community, and, and it will it'll be at a global level. How pervasive computing can help? 
So in, in any given environment, there are events taking place. So one of the things about pervasive computing is to, uh, first of all, recognize what kind of devices, what kind of things, what kind of services and resources are available in a given environment, and how I can recognize events. When events take place in an environment, I have to deploy services. I have to uh, create services so that the services can address the challenges that are raised by the event. Okay, whether it is a crisis management situation, if it is, if it is some floods in um, in a city, how we can use computing resources, okay, to utilize uh, computing resources to aid the humans. For example, last uh, last year around this time in Houston, there was a there was huge flooding. You might have heard about it. Okay, the city was many parts of the city was submerged in water, and they deployed a number of drones and unmanned aerial vehicles to help people to take pictures and to to determine what is happening where. It was not done automatically. It was done by with human intervention, but in the future, it will be nice if we can detect such events automatically, okay, and then deploy these resources that we have in the environment so that they can, they can be more proactive and things can be taken care of before they get, uh, get out of hand. So obviously, the um, uh, objective of pervasive computing is to provide timely, automated, and transparent services on a need basis. Uh, there are several challenges. I will go through some of these slides. This may be a bit dated for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with pervasive computing, but I will go through the slides just to underscore the challenges that we have in pervasive computing. Awareness is an, I'm, I'm, I'm going through one of these, each of these in, in more detail. Awareness is an important aspect of pervasive computing. So we want to create systems that are aware and we want the users, particularly the humans, aware of things that are happening around them. And we are looking at environments such as these. Smart home, we heard about a lot about smart home uh, yesterday when Joseph talked about his, his preparation for thesis. And then driverless cars are here, okay. They will be uh, in full flow maybe in 10, 15 years. There will be a lot of driverless cars on the, on the road and they are, each one is a smart environment and once you have a number of driverless cars, so every street and, and the connection of streets will be smart environments. So there will be uh, well, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, there will be uh, places like museums, which will be full of smart things, which can guide you to. to uh, there are already many museums which are smart. There are, there are so many smart uh, devices and things that, that are already there in, in museums. For example, uh, the, uh, the audio recordings, they automatically start when you go to a particular uh, museum piece. In most museums, it has happened. But it will further, further be... Um, uh, improved in the future. And you can think of any, any environment. Uh, shopping malls, airports, etc. will become uh, smart environments and we need to use pervasive computing technologies to, to make it happen. And the other issues that are of importance are uh, scale. I believe there will be about 50 billion things in about 10 years. So that is a huge number. So it is scalable and also it is very dynamic. So the, the, the type of devices we have is dynamic and, and uh, aspects such as networking, uh, software, et cetera, are very dynamic. And most importantly, data. Data is changing all the time. So handling this dynamicity and scalability are two of the huge challenges in pervasive computing. So I said about uh, pervasive awareness. So on one hand, we need to make systems that are, that are aware. The system should be aware of what is happening. Okay, and on the other hand, the um, context recognition 
and, and sensing capabilities of, of devices and things around us should help us understand what is going on around us. Okay? So, these are the areas that will be of interest to, to research, for example, modeling and understanding context. So, context, location is a context. Okay? The fact that uh, how many number of people he, that are here in this room is a context. So, there are, for example, if you want to adjust the air conditioning based on the number of people in this room, you need to know what is the context. Okay? How many people are there? You know, what is the outside temperature? and how much of energy I need to consume. So all those contexts are needed to determine what will be the temperature of this, this particular room. So context is an important, uh, very important to pervasive computing and understanding context is really, really difficult. Understanding context in, in environments where there, are, there is only one human is, is, is sort of has been addressed, particularly for smart homes and, and places where they have aged care systems that has been addressed. But when there are multiple people, humans are most complex, as we all know. So when there are multiple people, understanding context is very difficult. Okay, even as simple as one of you want uh, temperature to be 30 Celsius and the other one wants the temperature to be 26 Celsius, how do you uh, have a trade-off so that both of them are happy? So it's not easy. You like one music and your partner likes a different music. How do we make sure that both of them are satisfied? So understanding humans is really difficult. Understanding context in the presence of humans is, is the most difficult topic. So we need to have awareness at different scales. So individual scale, if, if the application is, first of all, the system that is providing the services should be aware whether the service that is provided is for the, for the individual, for a community, for a city, for, or for the entire world. The system should be aware of that. So there, the system should be aware of resources. So in a pervasive computing and environment, the system should be aware of what resources I have in this environment to do anything, okay? So to do anything. For example, let us say there is a building that is on fire. Okay, how do I utilize the resources within the building to make sure that people can uh, move from this particular building to a different place or to make sure that fire personnel can reach that building fast, or build, reach that particular floor in the building very fast. So basically the idea is how I can utilize whatever is available, whether it is devices or things, whatever is available to facilitate better or improved quality of life for, for humans. And also there are other things like um, efficient utilization of resources. So I, I, I have computing resources, I have communication resources, but it is important that I utilize these resources efficiently because there is not just one application that is running, there are many applications running and everything costs money and also time and delay. So I should make sure that all the resources are utilized. So the system should be aware of what is the residual resource available, for example, battery energy. Before you deploy a service, the system that is running on my cell phone, for example, should be aware that there's only 20% battery left on my phone. And the next time that I can connect to a PowerPoint is maybe 30 minutes away or 40 minutes away. So you should be aware what is the, what is the battery life on my device. So what is the memory, the residual memory on my device before I download some pictures. So this awareness is, is, is very important. Okay, so awareness at different levels Awareness of systems, awareness of individuals. Individuals should be aware of what are, what are the resources available, what are the services available, and what events are happening, and so on. So these are some of the areas that are particularly important, critical, to make these happen. Heterogeneity, I don't want to talk too much about it. All of you know about this. Heterogeneity is a huge problem. If you want to, if you have tried to make an Android device talk to an iOS device, you know how difficult it is. It is there from olden days when we had uh, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, operating system and Linux operating system to make these two talk to each other. And then uh, it has carried on from there. Uh, so there are not only the device's heterogeneity, but there, is, uh, there are problems at different levels. So devices and things. One of the big things is 
not only these devices, not only this iOS device, for example, sometimes they're not compatible with different versions. Okay, so when you buy, they want you to buy, keep buying more devices every year. Okay, so every time you get an improved version of the device, but that device may not be backward compatible. So you may not be able to run an app that you were running on the old device on the new device. So you may have to reinstall this, the app, or if you have a, an app that is running on a newer device, it may not run on an older device. So it is not easy. So addressing this or masking heterogeneity in, in any environment is, is a huge problem. So there is variance in communication protocols. So we have different standards, Zigbee, Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi Direct, and so on. So many other protocols, so many protocols are there. And it is difficult to make devices talk to each other. Software also changes, and also standards change. Okay, standards change, and, and it also standards as policy, they may change from country to country. And sometimes in the US, it may even change from state to state. Okay, so uh, for example, we, uh, we can use power adapters. Okay, for example, the power outlets are different in different countries. Okay, so we have a solution for that. We use the adapter. But again, there is something inbuilt in the adapter to make sure that uh, you plug in a um, plug in a, uh, a device that's supposed to run at uh, uh, 110 volts in the U.S. Okay, if you if I plug in at it's 220 or 240 here. If I plug in at what is the voltage here? 240. 240. If I plug in here, it should not burn out my laptop. So I should have enough protection in my in my adapters. Uh, in my power adapters to make sure it does not happen. I, I only get so much current into the device. So that has been sort of masked over the years, but we still have to carry on these adapters. What if you were not, uh, we don't have to carry these adapters when we go from one place to another place. So even such something as simple as that, we have not been able to address. Okay, and, and the problem is, is, is accentuated even more in, in, in computing and in, in devices and things. And this I already mentioned, and most of you are aware of this, understanding humans, particularly the interaction between humans and smart things, between uh, two humans, and between groups of humans and network of things is, is not easy. Data processing and storage, uh, and in, in many applications of pervasive computing, um, the data is, has spatial temporal properties. It is valid only for a certain period of time, and it is valid only for some geographic locations. It may not be valid after that. So it is important in many applications, like for example, traffic applications. You want to predict traffic, you want to gather data now and then process it and tell the user that this is going to the traffic, going to be the traffic in the next few minutes. Okay, you cannot predict what is going to happen in the next half an hour. Okay, and what you predict now is not going to be useful later on. It's not going to be useful 10 kilometers from here. It's going to be useful only here. So they have spatial temporal properties. Okay, the same with other kinds of applications. And security and privacy of data are, again, uh, two important aspects. And, and cost of encryption. So we know that encryption is very, very expensive. So there is something called homomorphic encryption. You can encrypt the data you want to protect your privacy. You can encrypt the data and then upload the data to the cloud. And then you can process the encrypted data in the cloud and get back the results and then decrypt the result to get what you wanted. So it's not as simple as we said. As I mentioned, because encryption and decryption are expensive tasks, they need huge computing power. Okay, so the cost of encryption is is really high, and and the same pro same problem is true for blockchains as well. And and the uh, other challenge that we have is, where do we want to do the computing or processing? whether we want to do the computing and processing within the device, on other devices nearby, and edge, and edge computers, or we, we want to transport to the cloud. 
Okay, this is, is always a challenge uh, because it's it depends on privacy. Okay, so you can one one solution as I mentioned is you can use homomorphic encryption, but then that is expensive in terms of time and also in terms of computing power. And if your data is very private, you don't want to send it to the cloud. You want to do it. Uh, in, 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 in the environment that is closer to you or the devices that you trust. But it may take more time for computation in the environment because the, the computing devices you have in your environment are not as powerful as those on the cloud. Okay? And of course, we have to balance between cost and delay. Uh, this is also something that you are all familiar with, security and privacy. Uh, I will not read this out. Uh, I will skip that and move ahead. Scalability, fortunately for pervasive computing, particularly when you are looking at closed environments, we are not really looking at uh, billions of users. Pervasive computing is for, uh, at most, maybe for a campus or for a, a shopping mall or that kind of environments. So we are looking at a smaller scale but the challenge here is we want to do the jobs in, in re jobs really fast. It should be performed in soft real time. So you, some events are taking place now. I need to detect what is happening now and then be able to provide the services based on what events have taken place now. So I cannot wait for too long. Whereas most of the things that we do on the internet have a significant delay. So what you, when you use Google, Okay, what you find on Google happened few minutes ago, few days ago, or few months ago, or whatever. Whereas in pervasive computing, in many of these applications, you want to know what is happening now so that you can deploy the services right now and you can provide, improve whatever you want to do. So the, the performance is, 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 a, is a, there's a stringent restriction in terms of performance. And in many of these applications, you want to process within the environment. Okay, you want to utilize the resources available in the environment because first of all, the privacy issue, and the second is even though cloud, you have faster devices, the, 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 the servers on, on in the cloud may be powered with GPUs, et cetera, may be more powerful, but to get cloud services when you want is not easy because they have already been committed to other services. So when, when some events take place in the environment and you want to use cloud services, first of all, you need the bandwidth to transport whatever processing you want, transport the data from, from your environment to the cloud. And that's not easy, in, that's not uh, inexpensive in terms of time. It can take significant time to transport the data if the bandwidth is not sufficient. So they cannot be guaranteed. So it is preferable to process within the environment, and not only that, but we need to be doing that very fast. And events and actions and data change very dynamically. So these are some of the problems that we have in pervasive computing environments. Uh, in addition to that, there are other challenges. So it will be important to balance between confli conflicting pairs of issues, for example, security and performance. You need to make a decision whether security is more important or whether I need to give the data or the result very fast. Privacy and usability. So these are all conflicting. Whether I want to, I want to utilize the system now, for example, in the future, you just want to walk into the airport, right? You want to walk into the airport. You don't want to bring out your passport. There will be something on your phone or on your hand or something that can automatically detect that you are you are the right person going through, and then you go to the to your uh, uh, assigned seat in the aircraft, and then say without having to do all that. And similarly, when you come out through immigration, everything happens automatically. So it's very easy. You want you want things to happen very easily, but then your privacy is impacted. So if anybody can uh, hack into the network, everything you do is is recorded. Okay, everything you do, uh, the big brother or the administrators who are controlling that will know exactly what you are doing, where you are at any given point of time. So you are compromising privacy and usability and quality and cost. So depending, again, it's context, I mentioned context and awareness, it's very important to know 
What is your context? So what are your preferences? What you need to do? What, what you are ready to compromise given the situation? For example, if, if I have a heart attack and I don't care about privacy, okay, I'm ready to give out all the data that I have so that some emergency personnel can come and save me. Okay, but if it is a different situation, I'm ready to wait. I don't want to compromise my privacy. And the other huge problem that we have in many of these uh, applications, particularly when it comes to participatory contributions. So, for example, crisis management situation. If you want to uh, deploy services in a crisis management situation, you want to utilize all the computing resources, all the sensing resources in the environment. That means you are utilizing every user's cell phone for sensing, for taking pictures, for uh, sending data, etc. But it may be all right for a crisis management situation, but for other situations, what is, the, what is, in, what is there for the, for the contributor or for the common man to contribute to this application? So there is no business model to give uh, to the common man. Some kind of a cryptocurrency or soft cash that can be given to people who contribute. So there's no, no really good business model for that. And we have to go through uh, government policies and legal issues. Again, these are uh, uh, not fixed. They keep changing from, from place to place and from time to time. Uh, this is something that summarizes everything that I talked about. So we have a huge amount of data. And most of the data that we have in the environment is redundant. Okay, how do we sift through that? And that's why we have machine learning algorithms today. How do we sift through that? That is a challenge. And a couple of things that we need to think about is, I'm not going to talk about this, but please think about it in, in spare time. What happened to all the CRT monitors we had 15 years ago? What happened to all the CRT monitors? What happened to all those TVs we had 20 years ago? What happened to all those uh, uh, desktop computers? We don't use desktop computers anymore. What happened to them? We throw them away. And they are impacting the environment. Okay? And we are going to have more things, more devices. We replace our phones every year or every two years. right? Uh, at least teenagers do that. Uh, uh, because uh, Apple and Samsung want to bring a new device every year with, with new features, and you want the latest device. So you throw away the old device. It is true that some of these devices get, get handed off to others. It happens over three or four cycles. After that, it gets thrown away. So when it gets thrown away, it is going to impact the environment. And, and there is a huge problem with, for example, the CRT monitors that have been, millions of CRT monitors have been discarded. They are out somewhere in the environment. Okay? So th there, is, there is a lot of study on that. So we are talking about things now. I mentioned there will be billion things. So everything in the universe will have some RFID tag, or will, may even have sensors, will have uh, electronics, copper, silver, uh, gold, all those uh, metals in those devices, and there may be some of them may be harmful to the environment. So they are all there on those things, and batteries. We use batteries for everything, and batteries are not good for the good for the environment either. We throw them away. Okay, so this is something to think about in your spare time. <laughs> but more importantly, now we are concerned about the data, right? So what happens to all the data that we collect? When, when, it, when will it get thrown away or will it stay forever in a, in a system? Okay, how is, it, how is it going to be useful and how is it going to benefit us users because somebody else is using our data? So in the next few minutes, I'm, I'm going to talk about empowering pervasive systems with things. So do I know how much more time we have? Just as much okay, time okay, want. good. Um, integrating things. Uh, 
So several years ago, we developed this model for service composition in pervasive computing. And uh, very recently, I've been thinking about extending, the, extending this model for things. So earlier, it was mainly for devices, uh, not for things. But um, I've been thinking about extending this for things. And it is, I have a very simple presentation of that, but it's going to be more complex when you actually go and implement. But I'm going to present this. So basically, a device with one or more of these, like a device that has a CPU, for example, a sensor has a CPU, has some sensing capabilities, has some memory, and it can communicate. So that means it has a radio, okay? So it can be described as a device. A thing, on the other hand, should have either a passive, the, of course you can consider devices also as things, that is fine, but if you want to consider other objects like this into the internet, so it should be equipped with some active or passive RFID code or a QR code. It could even be an object that I can recognize with my camera. I can use some pattern recognition skills and then uh, my camera can detect that this object is there, then I can use it in the Internet of Things. Just an example. It could be I can use sound, for example, something, uh, a bat. So it, has, it's, it, it sends signals at a particular uh, frequency. If I can detect that, I know there is a bat there. Okay, so I can use other means to detect there is an object or uh, a living thing somewhere in the environment. So I can represent every device uh, by two entities. Uh, one of them uh, is the, the hardware component of this, and the other is the software component of that. So the hardware basically is represented by a tuple H comma F. H represents what are the hardware components in that device, and F represents what are the functionalities. So there are different components. So for example, I have a heart rate monitor here. So the heart rate monitor, for example, has a CPU, it has a sensor, it has an analog to digital converter. Okay, it can, uh, uh, it can record ECG waveforms, it can convert the analog waveform into digital, it can record ECG waveform, it can detect some abnormalities in the ECG waveform. It can perform a number of functions. And also it can communicate. It has a Bluetooth radio and it can communicate with a cell phone or another device outside. So these are different functionalities it can perform. And of course, it has a number of programming modules built into that device. And it has some rules for behavior. For example, if the um, ECG waveform, you detect some abnormality or arrhythmia, then you do something or you alert the user. Okay, if it, is, if it is beyond something, you alert the user. So you have some kind of rules for behavior. Similarly, you have a temperature sensor in the environment. If the temperature goes about, uh, let us say, 35 Celsius, you give an alarm or you tell somebody the temperature is too high. Okay? So you can have some rules for behavior. If the temperature is below 30, there is nothing to worry. You can run your air, conditionings, air conditioning systems as, as they are. So based on the program modules and the rules of behavior, I can have some services. That services is, is an abstraction of the, of the um, resources that I have on the device. So every resource can be ab abstracted out as a service, and I represent the service uh, in, a, in, a, in an abstract way. I'm going to explain that very soon. So and the very important thing is I can represent this entire device as an agent, as a software agent, on my computer or on my phone, okay? So basically the agent carries all this uh, software and this agent can reside on my phone, okay? So whenever the heart rate monitor gives out a signal, gives out an output, this agent comes alive on my phone and does something. That is defined by the rules and services on the phone, okay? So the mobile agent is nothing but a piece of software that can reside anywhere. Agents basically represent services offered, offered by devices and things. And in the network or in the, in the cyber world, in the, in the, uh, on a phone or laptop or computer, we represent 
services as attributed service graphs and we create the service graph based on what is in the environment and store them. I will just explain how that is done. Yeah. I have a continuation of question. Sure. Here you mentioned agents, services and services software to buy the devices and in the previous slide you said that uh, if you can go there, yeah. Uh, in the device or thing, we have also components functionalities. I was wondering if, right. I mean, what, what is the difference? Is it granularity here? Or? Yeah, I didn't go into the, into the further details. For example, cell phone has different components, okay. right? Cell phone has a camera, it has a sensor, accelerometer, it has something else. It can, you can make a phone call, by the way. You can browse the internet. So you have all these are different functionalities. So there are different components in the cell phone. Okay, so, but for, for devices which are much simpler, the functionalities may be limited. So this is how we aggregate services in an environment. Um, I hope you can read that or no. By the way, this, this, is, this represents resource one, resource two, and resource three, okay? So basically here, um, I have three resources in an environment. I can manifest these, these, these resources are manifested as corresponding services. So I'm sure you can read that. So you don't really have to worry about the resources. These resources are represented as services. And all these services provided by these three resources are aggregated and stored on one device. Could be a smartphone, okay? So in this example, I have a heart rate monitor and I have, a, say, a wrist monitor, okay? And the, there are corresponding agents. This box represents an agent for the wrist monitor and this represents the agent for the heart rate monitor. They can communicate among themselves, it's possible, uh, but both are resource constrained, okay, compared to uh, a smartphone. So when a smartphone detects these two devices, okay, so it tells these two devices, okay, that you are in my communication environment. And then these two devices will treat this device as a parent node in the graph. And all the services that are provided by these devices, as well as the services provided by this smartphone, are represented by one set of aggregated services on the phone. Okay, so this is represented as a graph. So taking things a little further, let us go to the uh, a simple example. Let us say I'm blind and, and I, I detect this uh, whiteboard and I want to use the whiteboard, okay? So my phone detects, let us say there is a RFID tag on the board and that basically says this is the board I can, I can use, okay? This is a very, this is a toy example with, with things. Okay, so basically the, the, the cell phone detects the presence of a whiteboard. Maybe I'm outside, I do not, I'm looking for a whiteboard to do some work and there is an RFID tag inside this room and my phone detects there is a whiteboard in this room. Now I want a pen and an eraser to use a whiteboard. So let us say I can, I can detect these two. Uh, let us say I can detect the pen as an object recognition, I have a camera on my phone. The camera can detect the presence of a phone, of, of a pen, and the eraser is associated with a QR code, and the QR code tells me that there is an eraser. I have these two, and these two are connected with the phone now. Okay, I can have this information on my phone. Okay, the, the fact that there is, there is a whiteboard, the fact that there is a pen, and there is an eraser, so this is there, and all this information is gathered on this phone. Okay, this phone represents the services provided by the, by the uh, pen, the eraser, and the whiteboard. And the highest level service from these three is, is quite obvious. Basically, it's, it tells that I can use the phone. I can use the whiteboard to do something. Okay, so I can extrapolate this for any kind of application, so I have, I have several things in the environment and each thing is, is recognizable either by taking a picture and using some object recognition mechanism or I have a QR code or, or RFID associated with that object. I can, I can combine all these objects together 
and for each object there is a piece of software. Okay, the software basically tells you that what this can do, what, what is the f hardware here, it is a pen that can write, and how much of ink it has, for example. Maybe this, bo this eraser also will tell you information about how dirty it is, if it is uh, supposed to erase. And that information can be stored here. And I can use that information on this phone to create uh, the high-level application that is I can use whiteboard. So I can think of similar examples like, for example, in a machine uh, shop, you want to assemble things into something. Okay? So you want to create some, some object. You want, to, uh, you want to, let us say, uh, something as simple as uh, IKEA press. This is Sweden, IKEA. So you have, you have the, let us say, you have all the uh, pieces that you want to make a chair. You want to detect if, let us say, if each piece has um, I did not think about it last night. I should have used IKEA rather than this whiteboard. Uh, so let us say you have all the corresponding parts to build this chair, and you can detect all those corresponding parts with uh, a QR code. Okay, all you need to do is scan your phone around and see if you can recognize all the objects and an Allen key if you have everything, and then let yes, you can you can build this chair. So let us say the package that comes to you and then you scan your phone around all the objects, and then if everything is detected, then you can construct. And sometimes every now and then it happens, I have heard that some, something piece is missing in the package that you can't, you can't build what you want to. So you can use this method to, to do that, provided uh, I have some QR code at the least or an RFID. Okay, coming back to real things. Um, so I said I can build a an aggregated graph okay, with my heart monitor and a wrist monitor. And all the services that are provided by these two guys is represented on my phone. Um, similarly, let us say I have a door lock. I have uh, uh, eco egg that gives the pollution, etc. And I have uh, a camera embedded in a, in a light bulb. Okay, so let us say I have these three devices. Again, these three devices, let us say, have Bluetooth. They can communicate with each other. So what they do is, I did, I did not elaborate on this earlier. I did mention, I think, about the latch protocol. The latch protocol. Basically, what the latch protocol does is, when two devices are within communication ranges of each other, they exchange some basic messages. Like I mentioned, H comma F. What is the hardware on the device? And what are the functionalities of that hardware? and they exchange that information, and they quickly determine which is more powerful in terms of CPU power and memory, let us say. Or it could be any parameter. It could be battery energy, okay? So let us say CPU power and, and memory. So the two of them, in this example, uh, let me move ahead quickly here. So the two of them, the eco monitor, eco egg, and the door lock, let us say they can communicate with each, with each other. And then they exchange that H, H comma F, and similarly they exchange with the uh, bulb with the camera, and they determine the three of them determine are the bulb by itself determined by using simple distributed computing election algorithms. So they can detect uh, who is the more powerful among these three, and this will become the leader. Okay. Similarly, here cell phone is the leader compared to these two. So I have two little trees here, one to represent these devices and one to represent these devices. And I can build a bigger tree by using all this uh, with, the, with the smartphone at the top. Okay, it is the same smartphone, but it is, it's logically present here as well as here. So I have a bigger tree in this environment that comprises these uh, six devices. Okay, so I have a physical environment that has a heart rate monitor, a wrist monitor, an eco egg, um, a door lock, a camera, light bulb, and a, knife and, a, and a smartphone. Using all this, I can list out what are the different things that are available. Okay, I have these, these different devices, that is quite obvious. And going a little deeper, I can think about what are the different services I can provide in this environment. Okay, what are the different services I can provide? I can determine the heart condition of the patient, I can look at wealth, uh, health parameters, and so on. Okay, I can do all these things in this environment. So if this is your 
somebody's home with just these six devices, I can provide these services. Okay, now I, in addition to that, what I can do is, I can, I'm coming to that in the next slide. I remember I said each one, each service is, is represented as a graph. As in, in simple terms, each service is, is a node in a graph. So that I have a service, I have some input and an output. Okay, this is an attributed service. So that means you have, you can have all kinds of details about a service mentioned there. Okay, so this is one service. So I can, I can have one node or one little graph to represent each one of those services. Now, wherever I, can, I have the input, uh, sorry, the output of one service matching the input of the other, I can have a connection between those two and then I create, I can compose different kinds of services, okay, which are, which are at a higher level or application level services. Okay, so each, each service is treated as a transformational unit, accepting a set of inputs and producing a set of outputs. Each service faithfully works towards its desired goal. And uh, I just want to make the statement that we assume that there are no malicious services and we are not taking into account any trust and security issues. Services are represented as directed attributed graphs and each service has a set of attributes associated uh, it can be described using both semantic and syntactic information. For example, I have a service. Uh, let us say that service can uh, convert uh, yesterday or today morning. You were looking for conversion from um, uh, some Swedish words to uh, Persian speech. Okay, let us say I have, I have that service. Okay, I don't have that service. So I think this is a good example. Um, uh, so you were, uh, uh, Andreas was looking for a service that did not exist there, okay? That takes Swedish text. To Persian uh, speech. Right, so you did not have a service on your phone or the applications you had. So let us say in that environment, okay? In that environment, somebody had a service, okay, that can take Swedish text and convert that to um, English text. Right? And then I have a service that can convert English text into Persian speech. Uh, sorry, we should read the box sets to be consistent. I can convert this into so this is another service that takes the English text and converts to Persian speech. So this is both our text here. So I can find that suppose somebody else's phone has this app and another person's phone has this app. I can, I can find those apps because as I mentioned, when all devices know, become aware of another device, each device when it becomes aware of another device, they exchange this H comma F and then at the next level they exchange what services they, are, they each have. So every device knows in this environment, in the hierarchical, it's a hierarchical network, okay? So only this guy knows what everybody has but this guy knows what these three have, and this guy knows what these three have. So it's built hierarchically. So I have an aggregated graph. So if the service is available in the environment, I can find it. Because I have a graph at the highest level, an attributed graph at the highest level, and I can find it. There can be other constraints. For example, uh, that is the syntactic information. This purse, this service that is converting Spanish to text, Spanish text to English text, I don't know, just for, for the sake of argument, let us say they charge, okay, $2 per page, okay, and this charges $3 per page, but I have only $4. I can't use this service, even though 
the services are available, I can't use this service. So like that you can think about hundreds and thousands of different variations of each service. Okay, it could be that this, this particular service accepts inputs only at 100 kilobits per second. Okay, whereas my device here is outputting at a different rate. Okay, at 50 kilobits per second. So there is no match there. So in my attributed graph also tells me the syntactic information. So for each item, whether I can, I can uh, do a, first of all at a high level, can I do a, can I find a match? Can I compose a service? And once I'm able to compose a service, whether I, ha I can meet all the requirements for that composition in terms of syntactic information. So I can do that as well. Um, I will explain that quickly. So, so basically, as I said, this is a graph. It is. A, I will not read through this. This is a graph. Just remember it as G. It has uh, four entities there, which is the vertex set, edge set, and then we, the mu and epsilon basically represent the vertex attribute function, and, and epsilon represents the edge attribute function. For example, in the ECG waveform, we have ECG analog input coming, and there may be some attributes to that analog input coming at what speed and what frequency it is coming, and then how you can process that, and at what bandwidth you can output the data out. Okay, And for example, it can find the features of the QRS and ST, the two different segments in the ECG waveform, and at the, at the rate at which it can output the data. Okay, so these, this is the syntactic information. Okay, I have, I have mentioned one attribute here, delay, but there can be a different attribute like what is the cost for doing that. So like that I can build a, lo uh, a larger graph. So for example, this is, this is a toy example. So, but this is a real example here, converting from one text to a different kind of speech. Uh, but this example is to show that I have, uh, by the way, this is a complement of the graph that I, I represented earlier. I'm just representing here the services on the edges and the, and the inputs, outputs on the, on the nodes, which are represented by squares. Basically, I have different types of services, and each service has an out. S type is a service type. S type means service type, and P type is the, is the attribute of the syntactic information. So I can have... So for example, this, is, this may be the speed at which data is arriving, okay? And this might be the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the output resolution. For example, I get, I get data in a particular application at a particular speed, and then I convert the data into an image, okay? So this may be the resolution of the image that I can produce, okay? So just to give you an example. So, I have different services, and all the services are represented by a graph. So this is, this is a graph at the high level. And, and when I go to the lower level, this, this graph has more information in terms of what are the different attributes or the syntactic information. So this is constructed from here. First, I look at the, look at the higher level graph. I can see if I can, uh, I will see if I can compose a service. I can compose a service, S1, S4, and then there is one way of creating the service. Uh, this is one way of creating the service. The other way of creating the service is this way. Okay, I look at both paths and determine which is the feasible path for uh, creating that service. Okay, and it turns out in this toy example, it turns out this is the best path to match the corresponding uh, syntactic information. That is, we do. Um, the services from 6 to 4 to 2 and 5. So that is the path that is taken to create that service. Okay. So to summarize that, so we looked at that example. Uh, I'm, I'm taking only one part of the graphs. So by looking at the other graph, you can do, we can do more complex things. So basically, I have a uh, a heart monitor, and I have a wrist monitor, and I have a smartphone. So let us say the person who is, who is wearing the heart monitor has a heart condition, okay? And that is detected by the heart monitor. 
and let us say there is some information on the wrist monitor about some of his activity or his body temperature, his oxygen intake and that kind of information is there on his wrist monitor. So each one uh, based uh, corresponding to each device there is a corresponding um, agent that resides in the in the cyber world uh, in this example it will be on the on the I iPhone so I represent each service okay at the highest level I have a high level service that basically does something like if all conditions are satisfied okay to to come to the conclusion that this this particular person needs attention it can take uh, capture the window of the ECG okay say up upload it to the doctor's website or upload it to the doctor's phone so that the doctor can see what is going on and then make a decision make the call maybe maybe there is a uh, human intervention or he can call the patient and tell him to do some certain things so basically this is the high level service that can do things like make a phone call okay browse a particular file save a file and upload a file uh, using a directory of services including the, the doctor's phone or, or the relative's phone and so on. So basically it is building up from, from low level devices that are available in the environment to a high level service. Of course this example you will see that this, this is something that is already there. Okay, in, in smartphones it's already there. But this is to show how this can be built up. Okay, I can, uh, what I can do with this is, uh, I can explain what is there better with this. So, with, with small devices, I can figure out, I can build a graph and I can find different paths in the graph. And each path in the graph tells me, a compose, tells me about a composable service in the graph. That means a composable service in the environment. And that is, that is a bottom-up approach. And I can also do a bottom-up, top-down approach. Like I want, let us say, I want to make, build this room, which is secure, okay? Which is secure from, I don't know, whatever. Okay, let us say secure from intrusion. So if I want to build this room secure, that is secure from intrusion, what do I need? So that is the highest level service I want to do. So if you want to build a room which is secure from intrusion, what are the other low-level services I need to create? Okay, so I need I need okay, so 24 hour surveillance. I need uh, who to detect who comes in and who comes out of the door. Okay, I need to detect uh, how many people are in the room. Or I need to detect body temperatures. I need to I need some kind of sensors, and then based on those services I need, what are the hardware devices I need? I can I can make a top down approach to determine what I need in terms of devices and things for a particular environment. So services in a pervasive environment are represented by a directed graph and services are nothing but manif manifestations of uh, resources and devices and things. And each service has one or more inputs and, and outputs and a directed in the graph indicates composition of two services into one single service. A directed path indicates composition of multiple services into one service. And a multi-layered graph is created to represent the syntactic, syntactic information because if you have each device has different syntactic information, the size of the graph can be, can be infinite. So we don't create graphs of that size. Well, what you do is we have layered graphs. So we see the first level graph. Only if the conditions are satisfied in the first level graph, then we go and look at the low level graph. So otherwise the graph search can be, can be really expensive. So we use graph algorithms to address all these issues, also to find alternative ways to compose services, and we use bipartite matching to match resources in a, in a particular uh, environment to services. Uh, we use bottom-up for to find services and top-down to create services for a given environment. And this is the set of papers uh, uh, that are specifically on uh, service composition. So most of these are a little bit dated. There is one paper that we published last year and that is service composition which includes uh, opportunistic uh, communication between, between entities in, in smart environments. Uh, 
I have slides on that, but uh, I, will, I think I will I'll stop here. This is, this is a summary of what the research contributions myself and my group have done. Uh, we have done some work in distributed opportunistic computing, uh, middleware for pervasive computing, particularly in service composition. And uh, we have done a fair bit of work uh, in late 90s and early 2000 uh, in information acquisition, dissemination, uh, in pervasive distributed and sensor systems, and also in caching and prefetching. And before that, before uh, late 90s, in the 90s, I have done some work in parallel computing. So this is reverse chronological order. Okay. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>